Do you know what time it is? It's time for another awesome video. Whenever we talk about watches, especially luxury ones, Rolex is one of the top brands that we think of. It's widely known throughout the world because of its elegant design and exceptional quality. It's valued today at around $8 billion. In this video, we're going through the history of Rolex, who invented it, and why did it become so popular. Thanks for clicking on this video. We're Ignite Crunch, and we're glad to have you here. If you're new, subscribe, like, share. Also, tap that notification bell to get amazing content like this. Rolex started way back a century ago and started with an orphan teenager whose inheritance was swiped away from him. He had to overcome his life's challenges. He left his hometown and relocated to a different country. After a few years, he followed his heart and established a watchmaking business. Now let's start from the very beginning and see how it all unfolded. Hans Weldorf was born on March 22, 1881 in Kulmbach, Germany. His parents were Anna and Johann Daniel Wilsdorf. He was the second son of three children. His family operated a business that was inherited from his grandfather, dealing iron goods, putting them in the middle class. Unfortunately, his mother got sick during the next few years and passed away in 1892. A year later, his dad passed away, making Hans an orphan at 12 years old. He became under the custody of his mother's brothers. His uncle arranged to sell his family's business and use some of the funds for their education. Hans and his siblings were enrolled in a boarding school named Ernest in Coburg, located in Bavaria, Germany. He was considered an outsider and was considered bullied because of his religion. To get through his tough childhood, he concentrated on his academics, even though he didn't like the outcome of his uncle's decision. It became a key factor in his success. Hans was a bookworm and was bright. The subjects he excelled in were languages and mathematics. He learned English and French. He wanted to travel and knew that learning languages would come in handy. At school, he befriended a Swiss kid who told his stories about his place of birth in La Chaux de Fond. It's a city in Switzerland that was popular for its watchmaking industry, and Hans became fascinated. Hans left Ernest Tinum Coburg and moved to Geneva, Switzerland. At 19 years old, he became an apprentice for a global pearl exporting company. They were purchasing pearls and would sort, grade, and package them for sale. He witnessed that the company wasn't actually making anything, but was still making a profit. His friend presented him with a job at Kuno Corten. It was the biggest high-quality watchmaking business back in the day. They were shipping about a million Swiss francs worth of pocket watches every year. Coincidentally, it was in La Chaux de Fond, the place where Hans always wanted to go. Even though he already had a good paying job, his curiosity for the place and the business around watches compelled him to move. In 1900, he relocated to La Chaux de Fond and worked as a clerk and English correspondent. He was paid 80 Swiss francs monthly. His responsibilities were winding hundreds of pocket watches and confirming if they were accurate. He gained huge knowledge in watchmaking and how different types of watches were made. He then had to come back to his home country, Germany, and serve in the army after two years at Kuno Karten. After his service, he moved to London, England to work for a different company of high-class watches. His responsibilities grew and he was the head of increasing company sales. During those two years, he found more customers and maximized their sales over time. Hans was thinking of starting his own business of watches and was learning everything he could to gain more insights into his future company. During those years, he also met his wife, Florence Frances May Crotty. Hans and his brother-in-law, Alfred James Davis, decided to collaborate to start their own company. Hans had a passion for watches and Alfred had the money to invest in the business. They shook hands, and in 1905, they founded Wilsdorf and Davis Limited. 
which became Rolex a couple of years later. They partnered up with a Swiss company, Hermann Egler, which was located in Switzerland and began importing movements from the Swiss to England, putting them in watch cases. They opened a headquarters in Bienne, Switzerland. They specialized in the dispersal of timepieces at a reasonable price. Even though Hans was a watch enthusiast, he was not fond of pocket watches because for him, they were inconvenient. Back then, wrist watches were commonly worn by women like jewelry and were looked down upon by other people. It's because they were often not precise about the time. They were smaller than pocket watches and had smaller movements which would either make the watch speed up or slow down due to the tiny components in the movements. That's why pocket watches were more favorable. He then released his own wrist watches starting the same year he founded his company. Watch after watch, he was developing a better quality and dependable wrist watch for both men and women, applying everything that he discovered from other watchmakers. Soon, his company began to gain attraction by 1908. Hans wanted to alter the name of his company. He wanted something catchy, classy, and easy to pronounce. It needed to be short so that the new name could fit on the dial of the watch. He then finally came up with Rolex. He registered the name as a trademark for Wilsdorf and David Limited in 1908. In the following years, Rolex was becoming widely known for its high-grade wristwatches, and a lot of wealthy people were using it. The World War started, and many businesses such as watch firms were having a hard time. Some of them even had to shut down, but not Rolex. The unfortunate event only made Hans Watch Company even more popular. Soldiers were handed Rolex watches instead of ordinary pocket watches because it was safer and easier to use. They better coordinated with their invasions because of their precision. Hans Company had grown and they had 60 employees in 1914. They had office spaces in London. Rolex had triumph on their first ever wristwatch chronometer rating from Switzerland, followed by a Class A of precision from London's Kew Observatory. But like anything else in life, Hans also encountered difficulties. In 1914, the British applied a 33% tax for all businesses recorded in Great Britain that were shipping goods across international borders. Hans became concerned and moved his company's headquarters from London to Bienne, Switzerland so that he could avoid the taxes. Another reason for moving is because people from Britain began to despise the German people. Since his name Hans Wilsdorf is German and even though he registered Rolex before he was still using the Wilsdorf and Davis name in England, which was getting belittled, this led him to change his company name from Wilsdorf and Davis Limited to the Rolex Watch Corporation Limited in 1915. Ten years later, Hans registered Rolex trademark logo, the five-star which became part of the dial of their watches. In the year 1919, the Rolex Watch Corporation relocated its main office from Bienne to Geneva. The company concentrated on manufacturing the watch movements in BN and bringing them to Geneva where the movements were precise and completed with their high-class design and launching their watches. In 1926, Rolex debuted a model that would change the watch industry, the Rolex Oyster. It's the first waterproof wristwatch in the world. This model was fastened by a tight case that gave optimal security for the tiny watch movements, allowing it to be waterproof. In 1927, Hans heard about Mercedes Glides. It was said that she can swim across the English Channel, a 20.5 mile long body of water that divided France and England. People didn't believe her, so she had to do it again in front of a huge audience. Even though the water temperature was way colder, Hans saw the one-in-a-lifetime chance and told her to wear a Rolex Oyster watch around her neck. Mercedes swam for 10 hours. She emerged from the water after almost freezing to death and made it about four-fifths of the way across the channel. Although the task was not complete, the Rolex Oyster came out of the water in immaculate condition. Hans posted an ad in the London Mail newspaper about it. 
That was the first time that Rolex rose internationally as a revolutionary watch. He also showcased his Rolex Oyster inside of fish balls with live fish. This marketing strategy worked and people became drawn to the product. In 1928, he collaborated with Evelyn Lane and produced photos of her weaning the wristwatch inside a fish bowl. In 1933, it was featured in another newspaper related to a flight over Mount Everest. The team members who wore Rolexes were pleased to see that after the flight, their watches still worked perfectly. Another example is when Malcolm Campbell, a popular driver, set a speed record for driving around 300 miles per hour wearing his Rolex in 1935. Hans asked if he could publicize the race and he accepted it. According to Hans, only great marketing is needed to make a company successful. Rolex continued to intrigue people when they presented their updated model in 1931, the Rolex Oyster Perpetual. It's the first waterproof and self-winding wristwatch. The Rolex Oyster was a great model, but people still need to manually wind the watch, which made it tough because of its case. You had to unscrew the oyster crown first, wind it, and then re-screw it. However, it didn't last because of the dislike that British, French, and US markets had for Germany. Even after all of his achievements, Hans sometimes had difficulties making his way in the market and had to work extra hard to run a winning company because of his name. During World War II, Rolex had a hard time exporting the watches outside of Switzerland to other markets in Europe. Hans felt defeated and to add to the situation, his wife passed away in 1944. He established the Wilsdorf Foundation, a charity organization for social causes. Shortly after, Hans passed away. 100% of ownership was transferred to the Wilsdorf Foundation, which still owns Rolex up to this day. Because of that, Rolex will never go public, pay any taxes, or be sold because it's a charity. After the war, Rolex sold its 50,000th certified Rolex chronometer in 1946. Then came the Rolex Datejust, which debuted in 1945. It's the first ever waterproof wristwatch to show the date and month on the dial. It was followed by the Rolex Day Date. It's the first waterproof and self-winding watch that shows the date of the month and also the day of the week. Nowadays, these are the standard for normal use of wristwatches. Rolex continued to revolutionize the watch industry with even more outstanding watches such as the Rolex Submariner which was introduced in 1953. It's the first deep diving wristwatch that can dive 100 meters in the ocean without malfunctioning. Hans died in 1960. After his death, Rolex approached itself as the luxury brand it is in present times. They focus on marketing being a premier watch collection for people of high society. In 1985, Rolex began manufacturing their watches with 904L, expensive and durable steel, becoming the first ever watch to have it. Now you can better understand why Rolex is one of the most popular luxury wrist watches in the world. From a boy who started at the bottom, Hans Wilsdorf never gave up on his dream and is the reason why we have Rolex today. What is your favorite part about Hans Wilsdorf's life? Feel free to share it in the comments section. Thanks for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed learning about the history of Rolex. For more videos like this, share, like, and subscribe to our channel. Again, wear Ignite Crunch. Till next time.